this kicks off our EDA Fall Summit uh, 2020. Um, I know we are all very experienced now with uh, WebEx or WebEx or uh, Zoom. So, you know, what's another meeting uh, these days? But um, we wanted to keep this pretty, um, you know, pretty collaborative, a lot of interaction like we have in EDA summits in the past. Uh, a little tougher to do. So what I'm going to ask you to do is if you really got a statement to make, come off mute. Um, you will be muted when you come in or um, use the chat function. Function. Um, so just chat away. Uh, Dave Unger is going to be managing the chat and uh, we'll basically be answering your questions kind of as we go. The um, I'm going to go to the next slide. So. A couple years ago when we did, and I'm even going to go back four years ago when we did the poll in terms of what people were doing around the cloud, it was a universal, you know, kind of no hands up. And in fact, if you remember at that meeting, uh, Shesha presented why not the cloud for Intel at least. And, you know, over the years, cloud is becoming more, let's say, cost effective. Uh, let's say the driving force in terms of nanometer shrinkage is driving unpredictable compute demand. And we feel like the cost benefit for what is out there and utilization of current compute and storage resources, that cloud is now not just an option, it's probably the better choice. And so we're going to take you through sort of a, a discovery that we've been on um, between dashboarding and understanding utilization of the actual resources through data we're getting out of um, LSF to understanding, okay, look, if you're running at 40% utilization uh, for these workloads, why aren't you using, using the cloud? So that's your sort of your business case, financial case, and then how then now, okay, you've rationalized, boy, I should be using the cloud. How do I move those workloads to the cloud? And that's the, uh, that's today's agenda. Our co-sponsor is AWS. Uh, we started working with AWS on this problem about two years ago. Um, it started out in, for us in data science, um, moved into cloud migration, um, and then, you know, we're leveraging our resources within the cloud, um, you know, from a delivery standpoint, from a uh, architecture standpoint, and, you know, we achieved premier status this time last year. Um, and so as we look at the, the bench that can support this migration, and we all know this is a very complex workload, lots of different dependencies. Uh, we feel we've got the organization, both from an EDA experience standpoint, as well as a delivery team, as well as the data science team to really put this all together. The things that stand out for me are basically the number of engineers that we have certified, the data scientists that we have on staff, and just the sheer number of clients that we're engaging with around cloud opportunities within EDA. Uh, a little bit about the team, you'll hear from a Met. Uh, Dustin Milberg is our field CTO. He's got 10 years in EDA, started his career at Cadence. Uh, I've been in the business for a long time and we've got a couple other members of our team, but we have over 90 years hands-on EDA experience. We've got obviously the scheduler LSF SunGrid expertise for optimizing um, what is really in the compute grid, understanding its correlation uh, to the license use. Um, you know, we've got basically a ton of experience deploying HPC environments in the cloud. And then also layer on top of that, our data center experience. So, you know, we've got over 27 years of understanding the data center, both networking, storage, compute. On the storage side, we're a NetApp Star partner. We're one of the largest in the Bay Area, and we deal with a lot of EDA clients. So we understand, you know, what is on-prem, 
what can move to the cloud, and what those dependencies are. We do a lot of work with CVO. We do a lot of work outside of even, you know, challenging uh, NetApp, right? I think you, you know, from people who have attended the EDA summit in the past, uh, we've been very focused on alternatives to NetApp and file-based storage solutions. And we've been hosting the EDA summit for 25 years. I know Richard Pa is like, wow, we've known each other for 25 years, but I did some quick math the other day. Um, yeah, some of the clients, obviously we've got over 50 clients we engage with. Uh, we've been very focused on um, EDA solutions. Um, we've got eight custom EDA solutions of which we'll show you uh, three today. Uh, we're a go-to partner for um, AWS around the EDA vertical. Um, we're working with uh, AWS uh, around the SOCA architecture in developing um, security features uh, that uh, Dave Unger and uh, Brian Nelson will go through. That kind of goes into the security um, expertise that's needed around hardening these workloads. And then we have a full managed operation in place that can help you onboard clients. Um, so we'll go through that and then obviously sort of our uh, our logo chart, but interestingly, the, the logo chart had a lot of the different acquisitions. So if you see of a company that has been acquired in the last like 30 days, uh, I apologize in advance, but we've been we've been scrubbing this thing because uh, you know slowly but surely all the uh, all the companies are going to become uh, you know maybe five companies. So anyway, um, here's today's agenda, and at this point. Um, you know, Ahmet and John Gray are gonna take over with a live demo of the LSF uh, scheduler data analytics. Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of a round table with regard to what you see, features that you want to dive deeper in, data model, um, data flow, that kind of stuff. Um, and then Richard Pa is gonna talk about the EDA tool uh, vendors. So what are they, you know, what are they saying about um, using licenses in the cloud? And then from there, Dave Unger is going to take it over and talk very specifically about moving verification jobs into AWS and our methodology there. And then we also have a full chip architecture where you would have no dependencies on the outside um, you know, let's say uh, your your NetApp filers or your scheduler or your, you know, configuration management, um, you, that would be full chip in the cloud. And I, I know I, we've got a lot of enterprise clients, non-startup type clients. This is more targeted at startups or even universities. But interesting thing about this is if you're doing any collaboration with an outside entity on your chips and and somebody comes to you from the business and says hey i i, I need them to have access to our design our pdks uh but it has to be in a totally secure environment and you don't want to let them inside you know your data center this might be a method in which to um, collaborate with an outside entity or you're spinning up a new division, a new a new start, and you're not sure, you don't want to do a big compute resource uh, buy, this might be an alternative. So think of it in that context. Um, we'll do a little bit of a round table and then wrap up 1130. I booked this till noon. We've gone over many years in the past. So, you know, we'll, we'll Figure it'll end around 1130, but if we go to noon, uh, hopefully everybody's calendar is locked. And so with that, uh, John Gray, I think you're going to need to take over as host. I'm going to turn the ball over to you because Jennifer Vogel showed me how to do that. There we go. And then please come off, um, come off speaker if you uh, have any questions. Uh, you were all muted coming in. Um, but, uh, you know, really appreciate you guys all joining. John Gray, are you out there?
John, okay. you're still muted if you're trying to talk. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah, I'm here. Sorry, I'm trying to go through many screens to share uh, what I need to share here. here. Just give me a second, guys. No problem. Uh, probably going to see the wrong. Yeah, hang on. I need to switch screens. There you go. You well, okay. You should now see my intro That's and good. agenda. We do. You're all good. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. As, as Tom mentioned, I'm John Gray. I'm Intervision's CTO. Um, my background um, is you know, a lot of uh, working for product startup companies, um, system integrators. Kind of the, the thing that I've had a lot of success with in my career is uh, taking solutions we've developed for customers, you know, once or twice, and then, you know, identifying the common parts in those and building those into repeatable, into products or repeatable solutions we can get out to a broader group of, of customers. So that's, that's very much sort of the role I'm playing here. You know, I've got, and now I've got a pretty decent understanding of EDA, but it's, you know, it's, it's the product side of things and the architecture that where my skill set really comes in. Um, so what we're going to have here today in a minute, we've got a Matt. I'm just introducing him really. He's a senior data scientist here at Intervision, and he's got experience, expertise in applying machine learning and performing you know, deep analytics. So predictive analytics and analytics in the cloud infrastructure domain. Um, so he's you know very experienced in helping clients optimize compute environment efficiency. So that's what a lot of this is about. So he's got a quick site, AWS quick site, which is AWS's business intelligence um, data visualization tool. He's got a dashboard demo he's going to give in a minute uh, and go through that. And it's it's got a a lot going on in it. You you know. You're going to see five different tabs of data. Each tab has a, a whole bunch of different types of data, starting from very high level, going down into different pie charts and trending and um, heat maps, and then the actual granular data at the bottom. Uh, a lot of work gone into that. This is all built off uh, data that's coming from a data pipeline that's you know, RTM going into MariaDB and then into AWS 3, which is AWS's object store. And then AWS Glue is AWS's ETL tool that's got some really cool features in it that allow us to, you know, pick up and manipulate data and get it into a database. The QuickSight Spice DB is, you know, a, a very quick, effective sort of analytics database. So that's the pipeline we, we're using currently. Um, we've got some modifications coming to that uh, for next versions, and that's we'll get into describing that after Amet does the the demo with our EDA product roadmap that Dave Unger will actually speak to. Um, so, with that, I'm going to move on to the to the next slide and hand it over to Amet. Right, Matt, are you out there? Hopefully, you can find the mute button faster than I did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, John. So uh, the first step of the presentation is uh, about LSF scheduling architecture uh, to better understand how data uh, collected to build uh, engineering dashboard and also uh, how we can leverage the engineering dashboard to optimize the job command submission, BSOP job command, and also um, LSF uh, scheduler procedure. So a uh, user uh, submit job using uh, BSOP uh, command line, and then job the state query in the master host and in the job pen status. And uh, during that time, uh, master scheduler has communication with uh, a master load information manager and with the compute host. And master scheduler will uh, schedule the job based on the resource requirement, which is the defined in the BSUB submit uh, command, and also will uh, schedule job based on the LSF scheduler processor. So the LSF scheduler processor has like kind of a fair share uh, scheduling, or another one is kind of first come first serve. Uh, when we say like first come first serve, is not that mean like uh, it will uh, schedule the or based on the order of the submission. Is that mean the the fair share uh, is meaning 
it's scheduled based on the order of the QA, which is can be defined by LSF admin. So once master schedule find the best uh, host to schedule the job, it will give information. It will communicate with the master batch daemon, and then master batch daemon create a like kind of uh, execution environment, and then it's executed on the compute host. Well, once jobs start to run on the computers, uh, resource information and uh, job status information will be recorded based on the specific uh, time interval. And job uh, has uh, two different kind of results. It can be like uh, job complete, another, another, another one can be error. And this job error is that mean job either terminated by user or by admin and also can be like because of the run time limit or resource uh, utilization limit or it can be because of the software. So what we are doing, we are collecting pending information from master host and also uh, and actually LSF is providing the information from master host and also uh, from the compute host uh, job uh, resource utilization information. And also job cost information, like how much resource available and how much uh, maximum CPU, maximum memory is available and license information too. So the, here is important part, engineering dashboard can uh, help us to see like uh, what kind of optimization needed for the job command line. And also what kind of uh, optimization we need to do on the job uh, scheduling processor. And uh, also engineering dashboard can give a uh, kind of uh, more detailed information about resource utilization, uh, like at the team level and also at the user level. So uh, the, the important, another important thing, uh, we need to see like how we can uh, improve the LSF uh, job schedule performance. So, like we said, that can be done uh, with uh, B sub job command line optimization. Uh, I guess, John, you is stop sharing. Oh, I'm yeah. sorry. I, I I moved you to presenter. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, again, no uh, issues. No issues. Um, okay, let me see. If, let me see. sorry. I, I overthought it. I thought you were okay. in going into the demo. So. Yeah. I can share my screen if needed. Yeah, yeah. Get, just go in, just go into the demo. Why don't, why don't you go to it, Matt, at this point? Yeah. Yeah, so let me share my screen. You grab control. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So everyone can see my screen right now. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, uh, the last part which I was talking about, like uh, the, the increasing LSF uh, job schedule performance, like I said, that can be either uh, using the engineering dashboard functionality uh, to improve the job submission uh, command line and also job schedule procedure. Another thing is uh, like kind of training the user to make the, for their request more accurate. Um, so like this option is uh, very costly so because of that like we suggest like building machine learning bet model between user to uh, lsf scheduler uh, like machine it can be machine learning model or can be heuristic uh, analysis model so that, that these two option and so engineering dashboard right now we build the engineering dashboard this engineering dashboard has two important functionality it's like uh, kind of uh, it give the job run status uh, information and also we can see the uh, the resource utilization efficiency so on the dashboard right now this is the engineering dashboard which we built it uh, the first uh, step we want to show like how job performance is changing so for that we we created two different time trend line it is one is based on the start time another one is based on submit time so on the windows, it's, it's showing like uh, how much, how many job uh, submitted right now. We are, we have data uh, about like three months data in this time range, how much job submitted and runtime hour, pen time hour and average runtime hour and average pen time hours and 
time time runtime uh, rate and also uh, it's showing like average runtime hour is killed by owner average pen time or killed by admin so why we are doing this putting this information for example our first call they reduce the pen time over the runtime and because of that uh, we put like kind of threshold uh, the first call was the 10 so when the numbers go down to like uh, in, uh, decrease like less than 10 it will be turning the green so based on that uh, we can like see the day by day how this resource is changing when we apply the filter in the specific day we will see like these all numbers will be updated and also uh, we can apply specific time range like if you want to see in a specific time range we can uh, filter like one week or one month even we can filter based on the six month based on the data availability so another important part we put here like average runtime hour killed by owner so the the issue is like if job terminated by owner it can be like uh, different re uh, reasons so like one important reason it can be because of the user is not requesting like uh, enough memory or cpu and this causing a lot of uh, long run time and when users see that and then user terminating his job so as you can see like uh, job uh, when job killed by owner runtime is comparing the average runtime is too high so also we need to put these numbers in two different clusters like uh, some of them is really really very less time killing but the the most of them is very in the huge numbers so we need to put in the different cluster we will be seeing is these numbers will increase so another important part to understand user behavior while submitting job we created the submit time trend line. So in the submit time trend line, we will first explain this pie chart and we will go back to that part to ex how we can see the user behavior with the submit time. So as we said, like uh, in the LSF scheduler, there are like first come first serve uh, scheduling procedure. So uh, in that we said like uh, job can be scheduled based on the QA information. So because of that, we like kind of job type information, we created the percentile distribution for that to see how it's changing. And this distribution is created like based on the uh, number of jobs and also based on the runtime. Like it can be seen like, for example, short QA, it was like 39% while we do job count but when we go to with runtime percentile is uh, dramatically decreasing like six at 60 percent uh, 18 percent so i mean all of this data is coming out of which part of lsf or itm uh it's uh, okay so this the first part is basically from the compost information okay and okay. people be talking about the job pants it's coming from um, uh, the master host which is collected from master host Okay, so this is really a drill down on the on the specific job. Data, yeah, I, right. Yeah, okay. so, so another important part we say like uh, job can be completed and also job can be like give error or terminated. So when job terminated, it can be like because of the four different reasons, software or killed by owner, admin or because of the hardware. So, so what you know, what story is this telling us? Uh, the story is here, for example, we want to see, okay, uh, on the short queue, like on the specific queue information, like uh, job uh, terminated by, like, by the owner, right, by user, like when submitted job. So we want to see like top 10 user who is terminating their job, like uh, in the short queue, like from here, we are able to see, okay, in the short queue, who is terminating their job and then also job finish table is updated based on this filter like you can see this is the job finish table which is give more information about the, each job like even about the child jobs with the index id is mentioned here so we can specify okay what's happening in the specifically in the job and also we can filter apply another filter based on the user like when we apply the filter here again the job finish table we apply an extra filter short queue killed by owner and user one like one ygp so it will be like kind of updated based on this information so these stories will tell us like uh, what's happening when job terminated and why job terminated like i said another step maybe needed more uh, deep information we need to maybe put in different cluster like based on the uh, one job terminated based on the runtime we can get more information 
So, so as you move towards uh, building the recommendation engine, the machine learning part of it is the is the data in here that is you know either particularly useful, particularly indicative of certain things, or uh, this data actually like uh, this the, the information in the dashboard is useful to like kind of optimize the command job command like submission. Like when I say, for example, when we go to job pen. Specifically, I will talk about the wrong pen time, right? So this wrong pen time, right. because of the uh, user is not requesting really uh, enough resource, and th this is one one reason. Another reason is user if uh, submit a job, like for example in the BSAP command, they need to mention uh, watch uh, clock. If they are not mentioned this watch clock, and then job will stay on pending very very long time. So from here, uh, like uh, lead team or like LSF admin can under see like uh, what's happening in the uh, what what kind of things is causing these pen long pending times. Okay, so this could be overcome by people doing using BSUP differently, and or you know the the later phase where we put in the the recommendation, you know, the engine. Yeah. So, like I said, um, uh, like. It can be like either um, kind of give the training to users mm -hmm. to make their request more accurate, and this is really very hard. <laughs> it's not easy. But another one, we can put kind of some restriction on the job command uh, while submitting job. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, like we create also a heat map, like instead of the going like, for example, from here, we, have, we put on the short queue and then we put filter on the killed by owner. So instead of the going with that step, we created another part like heat map, and this is kind of shortcut. And we easy to see like in the short queue and uh, with the kill by uh, job owner and like uh, 135 key. So when we click that and then directly we'll apply these two different filters and we will be seeing like kill by owner in the short queue. So, uh, this is the uh, kind of will give the first step of the like uh, job uh, status information, what's happening in the compute host, and either like give the output error or uh, it, it's uh, it's it error or job completed. Another thing, like I said, I want to show the user behavior. So for example, when we look at the job killed by user, uh, we will see these numbers will be updated. So when, uh, or like, uh, let's see software license. When we look at the software license, uh, this rate is changing based on the number of jobs. Like for example, when we look at the specific, the peak, when the number of submission give the peak, the job termination is decreased. Like for example, let's go from here. We will see like uh, the percentile of the job uh, terminated by software is very less. Like most of the job is completed. So user, this is like very beneficial. Like we can see, okay, user is deciding to submit a lot of job here. And when we go to uh, the number of job submission, very less. And that day because of the, like also you can see like the performance is very less because it's not submitted too much job. And this is because like you can see the most of the job terminated that day. Okay. So we can deep dive more detail to see like what's happening in the job finish table, why this uh, job termination is happening in the software license level. Another step is job pending. So again, we create a, a kind of a start time uh, trend line to see like uh, how job is uh, like number of job is pending in the specific days based on the start time. So from here again, we create a kind of a queue distribution and from the queue distribution, it's showing like um, the percentile distribution based on job count and also based on the pen time. So we say like job scheduler is uh, working based on the like uh, kind of fair share or uh, first come first serve. So the queue information here is very important to redefine the uh, the job scheduler presser. So we can see like short queue with the number of counts is like uh, 
almost 53% and max T it was 40%. But when we look at the based on the pen time, max T is spending most, like 93% is max T. So, so Matt, the thing that surprised me when I first saw this was that there was a very large amount of pending jobs waiting to run, but there's also um, yeah. a lot of unused hardware capacity at the same time, which seems sort of, you know, didn't make sense to me initially until you sort of dug into yeah. it and showed it. Maybe you could talk some more about that. Yeah, sure. So uh, exactly. So resources available, but uh, like uh, in, in the job scheduler system, sometimes is uh, like if you not configure it or not define uh, job scheduling processor very well, like if you didn't define protocol very well, then it will cause a lot of uh, like pending, even resource uh, available that time. So, for example, like in the uh, in the job scheduler, if you put like you can put uh, priority on the specific job type. And also you can put priority on the based on the specific user. Like sometimes like some uh, semiconductor companies has kind of uh, blacklist on the uh, on the scheduling processor. So this kind of things is can be affect on the long pending. So it, they, that, that uh, processor need to be redefined if we see that kind of uh, problems. Yeah. Uh, so another uh, important part, like uh, we said, like uh, we are right now talking about the uh, job uh, pending is like why job is pending is uh, is it like uh, because also like we said, uh, okay, like LSF scheduling process need to be redefined. When we say that, like we are, it's, it's like, for example, if you look at the CPU and uh, memory percentile utilization is 37 uh, uh, pending actually. The pending on memory and pending on CPU is 37 and 37 percentile. So it's very huge number is because of the resource uh, not availability or like kind of uh, the posture. And we can easy to see easily to see like this distribution. And we can also drill down like based on the, for example, short key and specifically like, for example, I want to see what kind of software license needed and register pending. Like when we click on that, the numbers will show here uh, what kind of license needed like most pending license license one I didn't specify the license number here so it can be like uh, different under the different vendor it can be either under the cadence or it can be under the synopsis so different kind of vendor is there so under this vendors this license is uh, causing long pending so we can identify that if needed that license uh, more or like reduce the other license increase this license one so yeah. so in a way in this instance because i mean obviously the software licenses are very expensive so an organization may choose to you know accept that they're going to have pending you know based on software license but if that's the case, they've really overbought on hardware and software because the whole time they've got, you know, hardware sitting idle, right? Because it's pending on, on a software license. Is that the right way of potentially sort of analyzing what this is telling us? Yeah, that's yeah, that's exactly another uh, reason it can be long pending because of the license, even uh, resource available, but still mm -hmm. is because of the license. Yeah, so that's good point. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, like an important thing, also we need to do more analyze. Like this is like the first analyze, like about um, resource in the resource utilization. If uh, the the job command is not defined very well, uh, like we cannot uh, capture the license utilization information there uh, in in the uh, job finish table. So when we see that, and then maybe we need to give feedback, like kind of need to change some protocols to redefine the job submission and then capture the license utilization, uh, like actual license request and license utilization, both of them together. So uh, I'm, when I say the license utilization is the, it's user level, it's the job level. We can capture that user level, tool level, but it's important to also, we need to capture at the, uh, at the like, job level too, like each job index ID and job ID level. So here is like also job license features table is updated based on this filter, be able to see like what kind of vendor, is it synopsis or is it uh, cadence and uh, what kind of license is uh, pending a lot. Yeah, this is the uh, one functionality. 
The another important, this one is very important for the resource utilization. So from here, uh, we create like and on, on the top, like kind of we aggregated data and it's showing like number of jobs uh, right now is running and how much memory uh, utilized. We are mentioning a terabyte out instead of the gigabyte or terabyte because like host is available every time. So basically we need to multiply with the time clock and to capture the terabyte hours. And also how much memory used, how much memory waste, and also slots used and like slot used meaning like CPU multiplying with the hours, slot hours used. So uh, we created again trend line to see uh, the user behavior when they are requesting and not using uh, resource. Like for that first step, we created heat map. And this is the kind of uh, resource request when they submit a job, they need to basically mention how much node they need, how much like CPU or slot uh, they need and how, mu how much uh, uh, memory they needed. And this can be changed based on the, like it can need to be customized based on the company to company this uh, change. And like some company using the logarithmic scale, like one, two, three, four, like, or like five, seven, ten, and with this logarithmic scale. And some companies basically using like one CPU and one four CPU, uh, one like basic normal even numbers or uh, the, uh, with number orders. So, so, so this is an area um, where we would sort of customize the dashboard for each. Yeah, um, that one need to be customized based on yeah. the company. Which is, you know, with a tool like QuickSight is very easy and quick to do. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's, it's uh, we can change a filter on the window directly on the dashboard. Don't need to change in the, uh, in the query. Yeah. So. From here, like it's easy to see, uh, like where most of the wastage is happening. Like, like when we look at here, uh, here like fifteen CPU, uh, sixteen CPU, and most more than sixteen CPU requested, but one CPU used. Like we can see this user who is doing that. Like, and what kind of uh, training they needed. And when we click on that, that will update also. Uh, memory reserved and like used. So when we look at here, also same person or same like maybe same uh, users, uh, they are also wasting memory. Like when we click on the that filter, also like in here, most of the wastage is in here. So then all the tables will be updated. So it's easy to see like this user first user, he is wasting he or she is wasting uh, uh, a lot of uh, memory and CPU. And we are able to see from here how much terabyte hour wasted and how much slot hour wasted, like almost like 7.3 thousand uh, uh, slot hour wasted. So we want to, for example, see that this user behavior, when we click on that, this trend line will be updated. Let's see what kind of apply with. We apply the CPU wastage filter memory wastage filter and also for that specific user. Like it's easy to see from here, user behavior, how it's changing. Like the, this information can give us this user like recently joined this new project or he is just recently like, oh, he, he can be also contractor. Like sometimes contractors can waste a lot of memory and CPU just to mm -hmm. finish their job. Yeah. Just to add in here, I mean, this is the third tab we're looking at now. I mean, it's got a slightly different focus, but but the layout of of the tab is very similar. And you know, there's some key metrics, KPIs at the top, trend line, then you know, heat maps, bar charts, and data at the bottom. So that you know, there's quite a lot that's gone you know into this with how Amet has laid this data out to make it very sort of consumable within a tab. Um, you know, to break the different topics out across the tab. So this is, you know, sometimes when you see data visualization, you've got all kinds of data thrown and thrown together and it makes very little sense sort of in combination unless you spend a ton of time learning it. So what we, you know, what we're doing here and working with clients and doing usability testing and that sort of thing and listening to them is really, you know, increasingly um, honing how the visualization works to to give uh, both the sort of high level information and then the drill down the different levels of people need, quite frankly, right? So, yeah. 
So there's quite a lot to this. We, you know, it's pretty easy with this tool to adapt and change things, but it's also pretty easy to create a complete mess. So, um, you know, what, what's going on here is the result of quite a lot of work, um, you know, with, with a group of people. So um, I hope that comes over. Yeah, thanks for uh, explanation. <laughs> <laughs> so another like we said and also same thing we create for heat map for the memory as the reserved and used so and um, but but the important part also we are able to capture like a host level uh cpu memory utilization and this is the weekly average like you can also make in daily average also you can do monthly average so this is the weekly average based calculation so, like we said, host available every time, maximum CPU and memory available every time, but is we need to capture like uh, in the specific time range in the week, how much uh, job uh, running on this host and how much is used, how, how much percentile of the idle and request and unused. So this is the uh, kind of uh, showing us uh, host level, and this is the like kind of uh, uh, coefficient metrics about the host model and host type. For example, if you want to see host model number two, host type number two, who is the, in this cluster? So it's easy to see uh, what kind of uh, host is in this cluster and it's like percentile, also we can see the percentile distribution based on the usage. And another important part, uh, we, we're able to see from here, reserve uh, request unused reserve unused so when request unused is zero that's mean mostly like if you if you go back to here if you can see here like most of the request is one cpu and used one cpu this is because uh user even not sub not requesting cpu and lsf giving them default value one cpu and also here, like uh, if user not requesting enough memory, and also uh, SF give them the like default one gigabyte. So this hey, is a, a, yeah. uh, a question came in. Um, how do you know about the job slot wasting from a metric standpoint? Does LSF have that data? So. so when we say the slot out, is it percentile or percentile, I guess? So the matrix is not available there. We are doing the kind of mathematical calculations. Okay, thank you. This is the aggregation. Like I said, this is the weekly average. And we are doing it like, uh, okay, let me explain. So for example, say in a week and uh, the, the number of jobs is running and when we multiply with uh, this job based on the uh, runtime, see like uh, CPU runtime, and also we are able to see kind of uh, in that time range, how many CPU is available and with multiplying time. So this is kind of aggregation results. It's not directly available. Okay. Yeah. So another one also we created, we combined and another important part, we combined all the host information like available maximum CPU and memory we did another aggregation to calculate the day by day how CPU and memory utilization is changing. For example, here is showing, for example, December 5th is 16.4% uh, uh, utilized CPU and 35% uh, is idle and 1% request unused. And then same thing also we did for memory utilization. And also we can click on that in specific day to see like top 10 users who is using slot uh, hours and memory based on this uh, uh, this specific time range. And also job finish table will be updated based on that. Also, if you want to see specific users in this time range and uh, how they are using, um, uh, they are submitting job and how job is running, and then we can to see that information here. So we combined all these results. We created two different kinds of report. One is monthly, another one is weekly. So compute overview is a monthly based, like four weeks uh, report data. 
it basically will give you the resource utilization and job uh, status is running or terminated like kind of monthly and based on the queue information like is it in the short queue or is the long queue and this can be customized based on the the company needs because like i said this uh, optimization configuration is happening in lsf schedule processor so maybe they need a specific information or they we can put all of them together also so another one is weekly report and based on the scheduled time, this weekly report will be emailed the user, LSF admin team, and they will be see the results in the email every, like for example, every Sunday night or like in a specific uh, scheduled time. Yeah, this is dashboard which we have. So any question? On the yeah, that's a, that's a good. In, any questions from the uh, from the from the attendees? What uh, what do you guys think? Oh, and, uh, oh, this is, yeah, this is just a question on the CPU utilization. I presume that's just straight CPU utilization of the host, and probably would be proportional to how many slots are used on it. Um, question: Do you also track CPU utilization of the active slots only? So it's filtered. Uh, one level. So you only see the utilization of those actually running something. So let me remove the filter. So yeah, this is the basically is the online, which is the 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 online host. So the active utilization we are seeing. So uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat again? Like uh, what was the specific question? Yeah, so if, if um, I guess there's two ways to calculate CPU utilization. One is um, if you look at a host and only 50% of the slots are say 100% active, you'll see 50% CPU utilization for the whole host. But if you only looked at the slots that were active, that might be 100%. Yeah, 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 exactly. So right now, uh, so like I said, uh, some more redefined, like the to capture this host active or not active, the some information need to be defined in the like protocol and we need to capture that. So right now, yeah, exactly. We didn't, we are not uh, getting that information. We okay. are using, yeah, all the hosts uh, right now is running. So we didn't like put in the different clusters. Okay. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point. Could I mean it was? It's just I, I, a... no. It's it's easy. Like I'm saying, yeah. first uh, we need to get uh, like because like this configuration is changing company to company, so we need to get this information from directly company to put in the different uh, cluster. Yeah. One point I'd like to make about the. Um, a weekly report and the uh, email uh, capability we created uh, for that. Uh, the design idea behind that is that we would be creating customized uh, uh, weekly or monthly status reports for each individual team uh, within a company and sending them a report that's very tailored for here are the metrics your team cares about, here are the cues that matter, here are the users that matter. Uh, it, instead of trying to keep it company wide and, and cluster wide, uh, we can, you know, slice this a, as granularly a, as makes sense for each client so that the teams that need to go and adjust their behavior, adjust the way that they're submitting jobs or, you know, uh, maybe they can pay for different licenses. They can do exactly that uh, based on data that matters to them. So I have a question. How, how much data have you been processing with this? I mean, how large are the LSF clusters that you're pulling feeds for? This is Doug, this is Doug Quist with NVIDIA. We have giant clusters, so. I see. So this is one cluster actually, because uh, cur currently this company doesn't have multiple clusters. I did before for multiple clusters, uh, but right now, uh, currently we have uh, one cluster. We are right now, all this information is for one cluster. So how many jobs per day and, and, and that kind of thing? Yeah. So. Uh, with current clients, we have like, uh, okay, we have like, uh, almost like average, uh, like 150 K uh, job submission per day. 
So anybody that wants to sleuth a Met, though, on LinkedIn, you're going to find the client he's talking about. And they're not here today, and we know people there, but it's Qualcomm. Yeah. So at scale, Doug, I think that that you know he's built this data model for yeah. Uh, Qualcomm, we, did, so. we did build for mega data center like a huge data like in a, in a day like uh, almost like a million of the job it was submitting and also like uh, like also when we when we go deep dive in the job level uh, in granality like it's kind of we uh, number of the record it will be increased like it's turning from 1 million to 40 million because if you want to specifically catch uh, peak cpu or peak memory then numbers will be huge so for that uh, that time we were using the uh, like uh, really uh, uh, like high compute like and uh, we were running and uh, using the kind of different tools to handle that the the use case here is that the cluster that you're monitoring is actually in aws is that correct uh i guess dave can answer that question is not now is in, in AWS. It's an on prem. It's on prem. It's a standard compute yeah. grid. Okay. Uh, so there's so a shoving the data to to AWS, it, and then you build the the dashboard. Yeah, program. that's um, that's the little thing I described at the front. We're taking data from a Maria DB that I think that's on prem, and then sucking it into AWS to do the analytics. But the the entire you know LSF. Um, everything is on prem, and that's that's what struck me when I first saw this. Is how come you've got this massive amount of jobs pending yet at any given time? Half of that on prem hardware is sitting there idle. So you know, am I you know seeing this right? And the answer, yeah, I am. And it's to do with how they're getting scheduled, right? Yeah, and the point I would make is that uh, we can be you know pulling the data out of SLF. LSF, uh, Slurm, or UGE, or wherever a cluster is, um, getting it into our data lake in S3 and uh, doing the visualization. And because we've designed this the way we have with data being stored in primarily in S3, uh, it, it can scale immensely. Nice. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, any other questions? That was very good, Ahmed. Thank you. So, uh, Ahmed, can you share the final the roadmap slide, for Dave, to talk to? Sure. Yeah. So we're we're at the process now of gathering requirements, right? With engagements, but also, you know, investing with clients. So we've got additional features that you know we're putting together. Um, you know, obviously there's value in what you saw over what you currently get out of RTM, um, and also then where are we taking this? So, you know, again, it, it, it can be as easy as an engagement to roll out the current dashboard you saw doing the data mapping and then, you know, add to it the, uh, the features as they come available. So just kind of put that into context. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Uh, yeah, to cover some of the things that we've already highlighted in, in terms of, you know, uh, the most common uh, product feature enhancement requests and, and what, you know, client after client is asking for, you know, uh, number one on there. Uh, and, you know, the thing that excites us the most is, is building the machine learning model using AWS SageMaker so that we can, you know, have an active recommendation engine. Hey, if you're going to run this, then, you know, here's the reservation we uh, recommend you use or uh, hey you've said you know getting this finished quickly is high priority uh, maybe you should be running it on this other queue instead or or maybe it's this uh, uh, cluster and, and queue over in AWS so that's going to be a huge part of what we're doing and it's all about building enough data that we can start uh, you know gathering inferences and and figuring out how to help people tune their jobs uh, there's also a flip side to that though that says maybe uh, where the tuning needs to happen isn't so much on the you know job submission side. Maybe it's on the cluster side. Uh, uh, we're looking uh, uh, into how we can provide recommendations for, hey, you do have lots of job spending, but you do have a lot of resources. You might want to look at, at changing your oversubscription uh, uh, thresholds so that you get better use out of the hardware you've got. Um, that's dramatically different between how clients operate on-prem versus in the cloud, because if 
you know, you've already bought physical hardware, you've installed it on prem. You know, the whole mm -hmm. reason our utilization graph says used is green is because utilization is good. You want it to be maxed out. You want to be seeing, you know, 60%, 80% utilization on your on prem resources, you know, it, um, because that means you didn't waste money on hardware. Um, you don't necessarily want to do that in the cloud because you want to set a, a, a given budget for how much you're going to, you know, be willing to consume running jobs quickly. Um, you don't want to gratuitously use cycles just because they're available. There's too much compute available in the cloud for you to do it. Just, you know, let's do everything as fast as we possibly can. So the uh, recommendation engine uh, needs to be smart enough to understand there's a difference between, you know, bespoke and on-premise infrastructure and, you know, cloud resources in that regard. Another big request we've gotten is chargeback and showback uh, data visualization. Uh, and, you know, for some clients, that, that's hugely important. We want to know what projects uh, and, and what teams, you know, uh, our investment is being consumed by. For other ones, no, you know, we're not that, you know, um, uh, highly uh, regimented. We're not that tightly governed. You know, uh, we're never going to, you know, uh, uh, do the accounting work to bill it back to that team. So it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for uh, me to try to do a chargeback, but that data uh, still needs to plug in uh, to that recommendation engine. Like I said, for understanding the difference between on-prem and cloud, mm -hmm. the, the cost structure is different. So we need to have a way to get that in, even if uh, a client doesn't see particular business use or business need for it right now, uh, our recommendation engine is going to need that. Uh, we've also gotten a request for dynamic project discovery and visualization. Uh, there are some folks out there who have spent a lot of time and effort uh, customizing RTM with uh, schema uh, extensions, and uh, they're looking for you know a, a way to get that done much more quickly and efficiently. They they love our visualization and how it lets them get insights quickly, but how can they give us you know additional details for us to plug in? So we're actually creating. Uh, an API standard for if you do these extensions to your schema, we'll pick them up, we'll interpret them correctly, we'll uh, build that into the dashboard on the fly for you. Uh, forecasting also comes into play. Um, you know, when we were, you know, just worried about looking at, you know, a, a monthly report or a weekly report or maybe giving people interactive uh, access to the last couple months worth of data, you know, that's really interesting, That that's really useful. But then when you start looking at what was it a year ago or what was it for the entire course of this project that we did, now you can use that for forecasting. That's data that people have never had before because RTM, you know, uh, uh, rolls uh, uh, away data partitions and, and prunes data off in order to conserve space. Well, with us building a data lake, we've now got, you know, uh, almost a year of history for one client and we're, you know, building longer term uh, sets of data. So now we can go back and say, hey, based on what we've learned, you know, how much more efficient are we compared to where uh, we were a year ago? Or if we're going to look forward, you know, how much can a, a client expect to spend on this next chip design they do? How many, you know, CPU cycles are they going to need? And, you know, do they have that available in their on-prem clusters or do they need to spin that up in the cloud? That's really exciting for us. Uh, where it says data capture to support a recommendation engine, that goes back to, you know, um, uh, the chargeback and showback. In particular, um, um, we need to have a way to capture the manpower resource also. You know, it's not enough to simply know, okay, you know, here are the CPU cycles, here's the RAM, here are the software licenses, here's the storage that went in. Uh, we've also got clients that are saying, hey, you know, my team is a finite resource. They can't work on an infinite number of projects simultaneously. So even if the compute was available, I don't have the engineers uh, to do the design or, or to do the bug fixing. We're going to have to prioritize. So help us understand what our manpower consumption has been so that we can uh, also, you know, uh, factor that in, into your recommendations. Uh, uh, last point on here, uh, John already spoke to our data pipeline where today uh, uh, the data is going from LSF into RTM. RTM saves it in the MariaDB database. We take a SQL dump over to uh, AWS S3, use Glue as an ETL to get that into QuickSight's uh, memory resident SPICE database. But we've also still got that database that's sitting there, uh, the yeah. data repository sitting there on S3 that's exposed on uh, Athena as a SQL layer that we can query against for the longer term things. 
Uh, we've been doing that somewhat ad hoc for uh, data mining for the historical data going forward with version two. We're actually going to start streaming that data, you know, uh, through Kinesis into Redshift. So we've got it uh, more readily accessible for doing those uh, long term reports. Um, we're going to be doing that with aggregated data for the you know long term trending and the forecasting, and we're going to be doing that with extremely granular data for the recommendation engine. Uh, you know, it, uh, the inherent problem there is that if we're just taking you know default like ten minute slices of data out of uh, 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 RTM, then that doesn't uh, necessarily give us the details we need in order for making great recommendations, and so that leads to version number three where we're also going to update our data ingestion engine uh, so that it can uh, fetch data directly from LSF with greater uh, granularity and fetch data from license schedulers so that we can do a better job of correlating. You know, typically when you're dealing with uh, license consumption of, you know, uh, license scheduler or flex LM going to RTM, uh, yeah. you can tell that, you know, a certain number of licenses were consumed, but you don't necessarily have those tied directly to that was consumed by this job running for this project. Um, that's part of why we're building some uh, direct plumbing directly from license scheduler, but it's also so that clients that don't want to keep running RTM don't need to uh, once we've got our uh, uh, dashboard fully built out. It's a lot of information. And, uh, do you guys have any questions? Uh, certainly happy to uh, go in whatever direction you might want. No, thanks, Dave. That was uh, that was very, very good. Perfectly timed. Um, Richard, we're going to turn the ball over to you to talk about the EDA uh, tool providers and sort of what their position is on cloud. And then we'll probably take a short break between uh, Richard's section and then uh, Dave, you'll take the ball with Brian and uh, take us home with um, migrating those workloads to uh, leverage cloud resources. Cool. Okay, guys, um, can you see the presentation? You're in display mode, which has the okay. the chart to the right. All right. Let but, me. Yeah. How's that? There you go. You're good. Okay. All right. So. Um, my name's Richard Pa. Uh, some of you guys may know me from when I was with Synopsys and I ran the compute platform strategy over there. Uh, now I'm with AWS and I'm working with the, um, uh, the EDA vendors in, uh, in bringing the tools to the cloud. Okay. So Amazon, I mean, most of us think of Amazon as our constant stream of cardboard boxes during the pandemic. Um, but Amazon also, um, it, we're an AWS, um, um, with AWS, a lot of folks think of this as just the cloud, right? But Amazon also is part of the semiconductor industry. Um, we've got teams like the Amazon Devices team that builds um, devices such as Kindles and the Fires, right? Um, but also um, we build chips for our own data center use. So the Annapurna team um, who, who builds those chips does 100% development uh, from RTL to GDS2 on the cloud, right? And we've taped out several chips um, um, just on the cloud, right? Uh, the Graviton 1 and 2s, uh, which are the uh, risk processors in, that we use in our own data centers, were taped out that way, uh, done fully on the cloud. Um, the Inferentia uh, AI ML chip, um, also done that way. We just uh, announced uh, Trainium, which is an, uh, a training chip, right? also did um, fully developed on the cloud. Uh, Nitro, uh, that's their security and hypervisor chip. That's actually uh, significant for EDA because um, we've looked at uh, EDA, we've looked at the um, uh, virtual machines for a while, right? And we've always shied away from it because the overhead was way too high, right? Um, so that was the problem with the cloud when I first started looking at the cloud as well. With Nitro, the interesting thing is because the hypervisor is in hardware, um, it it allows us to be able to run virtual machines at near bare metal performance. So the hit is oftentimes a lot less than 1%. So um, when we were running the workloads, EDA workloads on, uh, on uh, the cloud using Nitro, we see as good or sometimes better performance than customers see on-prem, right? So 
Um, like I said, we work with all the major uh, EDA vendors, right? Um, and all of them, uh, all of their tools can run on AWS, right? So tools from Cadence, Mentor, Synopsys, they'll all run on AWS fine, right? Um, uh, Tom had mentioned uh, licensing, right? Um, all of them are still using the traditional EDA licensing model. So none of them have, um, uh, are, have yet embraced an on-demand model, right? And that's partly a business model issue, which we're talking about, partly technology, because FlexLM doesn't actually let you license um, be, below a certain date range, right? So again, we're talking to all the EDA vendors about that. Um, having said that, uh, Xilinx, who isn't technically an EDA vendor, they um, do have EDA tools that uh, is available on demand, and it actually is available on uh, AWS Marketplace on demand, right? Uh, we're also talking to um, IP providers, um, yield and test guys, uh, um, uh, and some of them have their actually uh, some of them have their tools on AWS, right? Um, also, smaller uh, a niche EDA players such as Imperium, who actually has a, a GPU-based Spice simulator, right? And we're working with them because they have a unique solution. In the past, um, G, you know, they're not the first guys to have GPU-based. EDA tools, right? And in the past, the problem's always been um, customers consuming uh, that tool needs to buy GPUs. They don't want to buy GPUs because it's additional hardware. They can't fully utilize it. Uh, because of that, the EDA, EDA vendors don't want to build GPU-based tools in a chicken egg situation. The, in, the thing that the cloud changes is that you don't have to buy the GPUs anymore. You just um, use it when you need it and just don't worry about it when you don't, right? Um, Tom had mentioned scale out computing in AWS. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because he's going to. We're going to go through it a lot more later. Uh, I just want to emphasize the fact that um, this was initially built by Amazon Devices for them to use uh, to run their own engineering compute tools um, themselves. Uh, we took that, open sourced it, and uh, made it available to customers uh, and partners to use as a uh, starting point to get onto the cloud uh, and be able, and it has the scaling capabilities and the management tools already built into it, right? Um, speaking about how we work with the EDA vendors, uh, one of the first things that we did with um, our partners at Synopsys was we did a scale test on Proteus, right? While Proteus isn't a tool that a lot of customers run, it is a very good tool to stress the, uh, the, the engineering environment with, right? Um, it's it's distributed, it runs a lot of cores. And what we did was we uh, we scaled it on one workload, right? Um, and got it up to tw to use 24,000 cores, um, which is more than what Synopsys has been able to do internally. Now, uh, we stopped the 24,000 cores because that was the goal and we kind of ran out of time. Um, we may, may, have be, may be able to go further than that, but um, we'll see what we have time to do that. Um, the important thing to look at this is that um, we did it while maintaining 98% linearity in scaling, right? Um, and in addition to that, um, you see two lines there. That the 98% the linearity is the on-demand standard way to run AWS. Uh, spot instances, uh, for those of you who aren't aware of what spot is, is that um, in the AWS environment, we oftentimes have excess capacity. And we make that capacity available to customers by providing at a discount, uh, oftentimes between up to 70 to 90% discount sometimes, right? Um, the caveat on that is that if another customer comes and needs to use that instance um, with on-demand, then that instance can be taken away, right? We'll give a two-minute warning and that instance will go away after two minutes. Um, what we're able to do with Spot is, uh, oh, with uh, Proteus is that when Proteus receives that two-minute warning, it'll shut down to work on that node, spawn it on a different node, right? Um, so if that particular instance starts to become scarce, um, it may be reclaimed and, it, and it'll restart somewhere else. Uh, if you notice, even with those interruptions, we get, we're getting a 97% plus linearity in, uh, in, in, in processing, right? And there's a blog there uh, that we would talk about this. If, uh, uh, if you want to find it, uh, either Google for it or reach out to me. I, you don't have to try to write, write that down. Uh, we also work with Jasper Gold um, on the Cadence side, right? So uh, we work with them to scale this out, and we actually presented this at um, 
both Jasper Gold um, Users Group as well as um, uh, Canis Life in Israel. But um, we did a test with them using the new Tensilica, um, new Tensilica uh, IP core. And uh, what we found was, uh, what they told us was, typically customers run at about 12 cores, right, for, for Jasper. We kicked it up to 8x that, uh, so we ran 96 cores. And we were able to get the uh, redu speed reduction down by five and a half x, and then um, then we ran a really big workload on uh, 960 cores, right? And we got that speed reduction down by 20 x. And um, in addition to that, um, running that big long job, um, they had to, they wouldn't have run that on prem because it would have taken a week to run, but um, running that big job allowed them to find more. Uh, properties and more bugs than if they would reasonably run on prem, right? So, uh, if they ran that on prem, it would have taken a week at uh, a 960 cores uh, on the cloud. Uh, it took them about 262 minutes, which is about you know, four hours and change, right? Um, the interesting thing about that is that Jasper Gold can also use um, spot instances, so it was just wasn't that expensive to do. Um, we also work with TSMC. We're part of TSMC VDE. So TSMC has acknowledged that uh, the security on um, AWS is something that they trust, right? Um, and they allow their uh, their PDKs and technology files to be to be used on uh, on AWS. Uh, similarly, we work with Samsung um, on their flows, and you can see that Cadence and Synopsys both have um, flows tested out on advanced nodes on, uh, on AWS. I mentioned Graviton 2, our ARM-based processors. Um, Cadence does support that with um, Liberate, Spectre, and Excelium, and Jasper Gold solvers uh, are supported on, uh, on Graviton 2, but the front end is not. So you need to run the front end on x86 and the solvers on Graviton 2, but that's you can do that on AWS. Mentor has Questa Sim that's uh, supported on there. Uh, Synopsys is rolling out VCS, Verity, and about 70 VIP titles um, in, uh, in this month, right, uh, for Graviton 2. And we'll be talking about that at DVCon uh, come March. Right? And there have other tools uh, that they're working on for Graviton 2 as well. Looking forward, um, as uh, you saw the uh, the dashboard that um, Intervision uh, presented, right? We also see customers um, using the cloud to do um, machine learning and, uh, uh, and to optimize their design environments. And I believe some of you guys are doing this on prem today, right? But you can do things like um, using the machine learning to optimize. Uh, job submissions um, with the technology that they mentioned in the dashboarding could use that to um, better schedule workloads in there, right? Um, hey, you're, you're, you were kind of on a roll, but um, is the 960 cores across multiple AWS nodes? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's across multiple AWS um, instances, right? Yep. So um, think of an instance as a server, right? A virtual server. So it was across multiple uh, AWS uh, instances, right? Um, and that's the other advantage because you're running multiple instances. If you have a spot interruption, then um, then it could just kick off that section of work on another on another uh, instance or similar instance or similar type of instance, right? So it gives it more resiliency when you do it that way as well. Right, and we actually ran um, Silicon Smart um, as a POC for one customer out of one hundred twenty thousand cores. Right, so yeah, we've been scale scale these things out quite a bit, and and we did all that um, using the Soka architecture that, uh, framework that we mentioned earlier. Right, um, in terms of the uh, machine learning, we're seeing customers be able to do this. Um, there are also things that we're looking at moving uh, into the future with running. Um, EDA tools on the cloud, things like um, we have something called Lambda functions, which uh, 
basically are event triggered functions, uh, custom functions that you can, uh, uh, they can make to do certain things. Um, we do this kind of, we kind of do this in EDA right now using cron jobs to detect the existence of a file and kicking off a, a shell script uh, to do some to do some work. But Lambda will make it easier to do that kind of thing. And then you could do things like um, when simulation is done, it picks up the file and then it pre-populates, uh, it, it runs a analysis script that pre-populates the, uh, the uh, pads that engineer needs to look at, right? So they can come in and just look at those pads more easily, things like that. Um, um, also, um, uh, Tom had mentioned uh, secure chambers. Um, that's something that actually, um, um, Annapurna uses right now with some of our vendors, but basically what a customer could do in that situation is uh, typically today, if you need to work with a, a third party um, design service house or an EDA vendor, and they need to bring them in to look at your design or, or, or if they need to do like, um, you may hire a design service uh, vendor to do um, either uh, physical verification or static timing analysis for you. Uh, you basically create a room, move servers in there, copy the data in, give them a car key, they can access there, they can go in, do their work, and then that hardware is oftentimes just left there. You need to basically clean the machine off afterwards, things like that. It's a pain, basically, right? Um, you could actually create a virtual version of that, uh, move the data over very easily, create secure access for them to come in. They could do the work and assign as many resources as you want to it. Um, and then when it's done, you move the data back or get rid of it. Um, you shut it down when they're not using it. So there's no way for anyone to get in. Um, and you can use that for either uh, a vendor. Um, you need to collaborate with an EDA, uh, EDA company for um, looking at bugs or IP company. Um, and that's basically how Annapurna uses it. And um, it's, it's, an, it's another capability you could do. Right? So there's a lot of things that we could do in the cloud moving forward that, um, that we haven't done in the past, right? And including things like um, when I mentioned with um, the GPU based uh, EDA tools, if uh, we can see eventually um, companies using things like even FPGAs to do, to accelerate a, a specific function that's used all the time, right? To make that more efficient, right? So there's a lot of capabilities that weren't available in the past. Okay. Great. Uh, any questions? Okay. All right. You nailed it. So, so Richard, if I could, or uh, I'm sorry, Tom, if I could, this is Derek. I'm the partner success manager here at AS. I just wanted to make a couple quick comments, if, if that's okay. Yeah, please do. Yeah. A absolutely. So, listen, I know uh, all of you that are joining us here today really understand that, you know, InterVision has got a 25-year history. They've helped a number of organizations transform their IT infrastructure and uh, so I'll, I'll give you all that and kind of trust that you, you understand that. What you may not know is just how uh, how strategic they've become as a partner to AWS as we continue to go down this journey together, specifically focusing on the semiconductor market space. And I can't say enough to all the qualifications and competencies that, that organization is going after. I mean, everything from DevOps to work, digital workplace, education, government migration, storage, I can go on. The number of talented folks that they have in their organization that come out of the semiconductor space and the certifications that they put them through on AWS. And so I, I did want to share, I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to let you know that we're really going after this market in a big way. And we see our relationship with InterVision really critical to being able to scale and service. So, um, you know, if you're searching for a partner that can help you articulate your vision or guide you through the cloud journey and kind of even co own the, the outcome if you need. InterVision is good, they're great, and they're tied in very strategically to AWS. All right, thank you. I appreciate it, definitely. And uh, right back at you, AWS, you guys are an amazing partner. So I think with that, let's take a quick five minute break. We'll be coming back online at uh, four minute break, 1025. Um, and we're going to start off with uh, Dave Unger and uh, Brian Nelson. So, um, yeah, 10, 10 25, we'll start back up.
Okay. Yeah. Sorry. We. Uh, Dave is uh, loading up his uh, presentation here. No worries. Uh, thanks, Tom. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, certainly have uh, slides to share. If people have questions, I'm, you know, clearly not going to be monitoring the chat myself right now. Tom's going to help me with that, I'm sure. Yep. But feel free to come off mute and uh, ask questions in real time if you like. Uh, there's certainly a lot to cover. Um, tiny bit of background on me. Um, uh, yeah, Tom, you may have understated our uh, 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 company background in uh, uh, EDA, by the way. Uh, I've got 27 years working in IT myself. I worked my way up from IT help desk uh, to a director of tech ops. Uh, it, and, uh, you know, after 15 years on the customer side, I then spent 10 years as the senior director of engineering and a principal architect at a different uh uh, system integrator, uh, and, and during those years, Cadence and Synopsys were my clients, uh, along with a, a couple smaller companies. So I've certainly got some of my own EDA background, and in particular, I was the subject matter expert uh, at my last company for designing and optimizing complex application systems for figuring out what the right ratio is of CPU to RAM to network bandwidth, storage performance, storage capacity, and, and then you know. Uh, comparing all of that against cost, because you could build something really big and huge and awesome uh, if you're willing to pay a ton. So how do you figure out what the right size is uh, at a reasonable price? Uh, and that directly translates into what we're uh, doing in the cloud. So, you know, I, I'm actually a, a client director these days. Uh, uh, another word uh, for uh, uh, sales guy, account executive, but super technical one. I get uh, to have the fun job of connecting the dots between our clients and, and our architects and post sales engineers for how to figure out what the right solution is, how to get it deployed, how to get it up and running. And I can also help you guys figure out how to pitch that to uh, your IT steering committee, to your CFO, uh, to the board of directors, because funding expensive projects that you've never done before and, you know, don't have a, a you know a, a you know laundry list of uh, references for well all of our other competitors have done it that's why we need to do it too that can be daunting so I can certainly help you guys understand what we could do uh, what's going to be involved and how we're going to get it done together uh, and that's why I'm here describing some of what we've been doing I like tying it back to one of the slides that Tom showed initially the cloud first drivers that are really prompting people to say. You know, here's why I want to spin up some EDA workloads in the cloud. Uh, and the ones uh, I'm going to be covering in particular today come from things like uh, with the, uh, 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 you know, density, uh, you know, of processes shrinking, um, you know, driving unpredictable HPC consumption. Well, you know, it's unpredictable, but it's not. We know that as uh, processes have shrunk, that you know, uh, verification workloads have gone from needing a thousand cores or two thousand cores to six thousand to ten thousand to twenty thousand. Uh, and now, if you know you're actually going to be running those compute jobs in the cloud, where you're paying by the hour instead of paying for a sunk cost uh, and trying to you know buy enough hardware to cover the peak, well, you can actually save calendar days uh, if you run the workloads at a broader scale, more uh, parallelized. Um, you don't have to go, well, you know, there's a cap to what I'm willing to spend because I can only spend, you know, 8 million or 10, 10 million on compute nodes this year. Well, you're only going to be using them by the hour. So if you're going to pay the same price per hour, regardless of how many you run in parallel, then run more, uh, at least until the output catches up with your people. You know, uh, there's no sense in finishing jobs uh, so fast that you don't have people to go look at the bugs that have been found or, or double check the verification work or, or take the next step. But so do that dance and we can help you with that. Uh, the other major thing here, HPC and scale out file services cost, it, it's just getting real expensive to keep throwing more hardware at an on-prem in infrastructure. Uh, we can help uh, you guys decide uh, how to move it to the cloud and, and figure out in, in advance uh, some of what that uh, TCO is likely to look uh, like. That's hard to do uh, if you're not working with a partner like InterVision that's actually done it before. So we're gonna be ha happy to help you guys with that. Uh, ideal fit number one, uh, you know, Tom already uh, uh, mentioned this, uh, the way we uh, see this, uh, you know, being most relevant to most people it is moving the uh, verification jobs into the cloud 
uh, because those are hugely computationally in uh, intensive. When a project first starts out, it's small, and the verification jobs, they run quickly. Uh, there's not much going on. But by the time you're, you know, 12 months, 18 months, or or at the far end of the job, you're, you're uh, ready to do final verification and tape out. Now, all of a sudden, you need 20,000 cores, or you need 100,000 cores. And, and cloud is ideal for that. Uh, it's also uh, useful for validating potential platform changes, like, you know, Graviton processors. Uh, you know, if you can use those and, and get your uh, compute jobs to run uh, more cost effectively, then you want to validate that. Well, perfect thing to do uh, in the cloud or comparing Intel versus AMD and, you know, uh, different uh, memory to CPU um, uh, allocations. Hey, if I want to use twice as much memory with the same number of CPUs, because memory seems to be uh, what's causing my jobs to fail, you know, how's that going to work? Well, do the experiment in the cloud uh, where you're paying for it on a per hour basis instead of uh, buying, a, you know, a rack or a half rack of new servers. Um, the caveat is that doing these sort of uh, job moves to the cloud requires a, a really clearly defined combination of applications, compute resources, and file systems. Um, you have to understand the requirements in advance. With the applications, for instance, you're dealing with competing um, dependencies of, you know, uh, uh, this tool that I want to run uh, needs this version of uh, this utility. This other one needs this. That gets difficult and challenging. Um, I'll, I'll share in a second some of what we can do about that. So our recommended approach includes uh, uh, for the job scheduler, uh, IBM Spectrum LSF 10.1 fixed pack eight or higher. Um, it works well in Amazon. Uh, we've got Ansible scripts to deploy it. We can get it up and running quickly. And we can do it one of two ways. We can do it as a completely isolated cluster. It's just an experiment in the cloud and it's going to be you know, apart from what you've got. Or we can do it as a, a stretch cluster or multi-cluster attached to what you've got on premise, as long as you're at fixed back eight or higher. If you're older than that, we're gonna stick to an isolated cluster uh, to make sure things work well. But you know, if you've got, a, a, a cluster on prem that's uh, running, you know, current or current minus one or two because current is fixed back ten. Uh, if you're within uh, 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 two fixed backs of that, then we can actually do a multi uh, uh, cluster approach and get it tied into what you've already got. Makes it easier for us to pick up the job definitions, the queue definitions, and, and uh, mirror what you've got instead of uh, rebuilding things from scratch. But like I said, we can do it either way. Uh, it also requires running CentOS or uh, Red Hat. 7.4 or higher. Well, you know, there are some people that look at this and go, I wish I was there. I haven't been able to take the downtime on my cluster on-prem in order to bring it up to that. Well, we can help you spin up a new cluster that's already there. So, um, you know, on the one hand, you have to. On the other hand, you get to. And, you know, that's got some big benefits for some of the clients we've been working with. On top of that, we've already put a lot of effort into building some Amazon machine images, uh, AMI files, uh, that we can spin up quickly that, you know, they're already, you know, uh, pre-baked or partially pre-baked. We can layer some uh, 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 additional uh, Ansible uh, Terraform or uh, Chef automation on top of that. We can make sure you guys get um, the machines that you need uh, without having to do, you know, all of that, you know, grunt work and uh, heavy lifting yourselves. And then the last uh, point I want to make here is that it also requires having separate file systems for the tools, the user home directories, and project files. Ideally, if you're going to be just moving verification jobs or discrete workloads into the cloud, you want that to be done with file systems or directories that can be synced asynchronously, asynchronously before your jobs run and then synced back again afterward. Uh, if the way that you've got your uh, file system and your namespace is created uh, requires that data to be synced in real time, you know, live copies uh, on prem and in the cloud simultaneously. That's a, a pretty big challenge. That makes things a lot harder. So we would uh, highly encourage you to pick particular workloads uh, to move first, where uh, it can be done as a simple sync uh, operation before the job starts and after the job runs. Instead, uh, we've got many different uh, uh, ISVs that we've worked with. Uh, NetApp, uh, Quobyte, DDN, et cetera, for, you know, uh, different ways we can, uh, uh, different solutions we can use for how to do the storage. Uh, we can do rsync. We can do a whole lot of different uh, approaches. Um, but having this, uh, you know, uh, 
mindset of let's take data where we can copy it to the cloud, run against it, and then copy it back if we need to makes things a lot easier than, you know, we just want our cluster to be bursting back and forth right away. Um, hopefully that makes sense. If you've got questions, uh, let me know. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm manning the, uh, the chat function. So anybody just wants to chat in, go ahead. Cool. Thanks, Tom. Um, actually the, the last point I'll make on this one, uh, with, you know, uh, us highly recommending that you, you know, uh, take a, a discrete chunk of jobs, copy the data, run the jobs and, and uh, uh, pull a copy back again. Uh, that can work the other way too. Um, it could uh, just as easily be, you know, we've got these workloads that are always going to run in the cloud. And if, and when we need the data on prem, then we're going to sync it back. Um, uh, I've actually seen uh, uh, some use cases where, you know, it makes sense. We know that these verification jobs are always going to use more compute resources than we want to make available to them on prem. So their now their new home, is permanently in the cloud, we'll pull copies back as we need to. Ideal fit number two, uh, full chip design in the cloud. This is where things get really super interesting uh, because there are things you can do in the cloud that you just can't do on-prem. Like uh, Richard was saying, it, it makes it a lot easier to do collaboration uh, with third parties. If you've got uh, uh, outside teams that are uh, needing to check on how their applications are running and, and uh, verify a bug with you, then there's a way to uh, make it available to them. Uh, but uh, to go over the, the basic architecture here, uh, if you're going to do a full chip design in the cloud, it starts with you need a shared services account that's going to manage things like uh, single sign-on, where we've you know, uh, uh, put AWS Cognito on here as our preferred single sign-on uh, engine because it can talk to Active Directory and a lot of other uh, identity sources. Uh, we've also got AWS Transfer for SFTP on here because that's uh, the preferred method we've seen with our clients of, here's how I'm going to get intellectual property into uh, your uh, cloud chamber or back out again. That way it's well secured, it's well tracked, it's well audited. Uh, and then for each engineering team that's going to do uh, development or verification services, uh, we. We recommend creating a separate account for them with a virtual private cloud inside and the virtual desktops that they're going to use. We've got uh, multiple different ways we can uh, spin those up. Uh, we can do it using AWS AppStream or a, a nice server um, uh, built directly uh, into the infrastructure. It depends on what's most useful uh, for you folks. Uh, if we're gonna use AppStream, for instance, then you, know, you see in the top right, there's the virtual desktop image management where we actually create the golden images with, hey, here are the tools that someone with this role is going to need. They're going to need uh, these tools for the front end or for verification or whatever the course may be. And we're going to make those available. And it then makes it very easy to, you know, just nuke it and replace it with a current desktop image, the current set of tools they need. It makes it a lot easier to roll out new versions or bug fixes uh, uh, to, you know, anything someone's going to need on their desktop while keeping it here in the secure cloud chamber. Uh, inside that engineering uh, team account, by the way, uh, that's where we've seen people keep their home directories. Um, you know, the um, performance requirements are significantly different uh, from company to company for home directories. Uh, for a lot of folks, uh, uh, Amazon Elastic File System is going to be adequate because it's uh, just read uh, sometimes. Other folks are going to need much higher performance. And we can do that with uh, uh, FSX for Luster or NetApp CVO or uh, multiple different ways. Bottom right, you see the HPC cluster where host groups are created. Those could be um, uh, Intel processor design. Those could be Graviton. Those could be AMD. Um, we can slice those and dice those the way that makes sense. There are brand new uh, Amazon instances that are specifically designed for EDA workloads like the M5Z. Uh, uh, instances that have, you know, extremely high amounts of memory available and a, a 4.5 gigahertz clock. Um, the entire reason they exist is to make it um, a lot more cost effective to run expensive licensed software uh, because you've got the fastest clock speed you can possibly get. The job's going to finish faster and it's going to be more cost effective for you because it's going to save you money uh, on those licenses. Um, uh, so, you know, we can help you guys spin up different host groups, ones that are going to be 
running the you know general purpose you know M5 or, or high uh, memory uh, R5 instances. Uh, we can do the super high uh, 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 clock speed and memory uh, uh, instances of uh, M5Z or Z1D. Um, it, we can help you guys do the experimentation. Where it comes to uh, um, making things uh, really hum along is getting those tool directories uh, set up and, and usable by each of your host groups and the project files you're going to be iterating against. And as you can see from the uh, line that ties back to the uh, AWS transfer for SFTP, um, that's one way you could be moving uh, uh, project files to and from the cloud. Another option that we don't have uh, uh, specifically uh, uh, drawn on here, though, the shared services account could have a direct connect back to your uh, 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 on-premise infrastructure, uh, the colos where you're running your clusters, and we could be using those uh, 10 gigabit or, or faster pipes for doing the transfer with or without a VPN layered on top, depending on what your security team uh, thinks is going to be the, the best fit for your compliance needs. Yeah, hey, Dave, um, and I know you've got Brian Nelson on the call. Um, and we did have a question with regard to the Secure Chamber uh, Collaboration Hub, as we're calling it. Can you go through the security architecture that we've laid out for that? Because I know it's a little more unique than just, you know, a typical, um, you know, moving a workload independent or a, a single workload to uh, to AWS. Sure. Um, yeah, this design here is actually based on the uh, secure chamber because we found that uh, semiconductor companies in general are extremely concerned about security of their intellectual property. So the same ideas are built into it. Uh, but uh, the one thing that would change if we were to make this a you know cloud chamber for collaboration purposes is we'd be spinning up you know a, a new you know where it says engineering team account in the middle here. We would create a separate. Uh, account just for the users from that third party, whether it's the, uh, you know, uh, uh, company operating the fabs with the intellectual property, whether it's a, a tool vendor, uh, they would have their own account uh, spun up in here with a, a dedicated private subnet and, and their own virtual desktops. All that access is going to be coming from internet through the VPN with single sign on. Uh, that could be delegated to, hey, you know, if our company is going to partner with somebody else, uh, we want to attach them uh, where they have role-based access control. They can add additional users from their organization uh, to uh, their specific isolated team account uh, and, uh, you know, basically have delegated access for adding and removing users. Uh, but, uh, uh, that's really where things come into play of, you know, uh, the cloud chamber provides a, additional isolated team accounts with virtual desktops that only have access to what they should. Uh, and, you know, uh, in the most extreme case, it could be we then create a, an entirely new HPC cluster just to run the workloads that that team is going to be inspecting. Um, one thing I want to specifically call out, by the way, in terms of, you know, the, the methodology we've created and the experience we've built uh, with clients, uh, we held a, a cloud summit, uh, a virtual summit a, a couple of weeks ago. And one of the things we heard from multiple clients was uh, their big lesson learned recently is don't make your own mistakes. Don't try to do everything yourself. Learn from people who have already uh, uh, gone ahead. Work with partners like InterVision that already have some expertise. If uh, uh, you guys uh, were to spin up your own HPC cluster in the cloud, uh, it, you know, create your own host group, uh, create your own shared storage, uh, you've got a couple challenges you would probably uh, uh, run in, into, you know, uh, decision points where you could trip over, hey, here's the cloud way of doing something versus here's the EDA in the cloud specific way of doing things. A traditional you know, a uh, consulting organization that just knows how to migrate things to the cloud is going to tell you, take that HPC cluster, spread it across multiple Amazon availability zones for high availability. You know, that is the, you know, uh, you know, primary uh, design uh, pattern that people use in the cloud. Well, you guys being uh, EDA customers running, you know, high performance computing clusters, don't do that. <laughs> that that's actually the exact opposite where uh, you see this, 
design here and where it says HPC cluster, our recommendation is run that particular cluster just, just in sure. one availability zone. You want the lowest possible latency you can get between compute and storage. And if you do stretch that between multiple AZs, not only are you going to see worse performance, but now you're going to start paying one cent per gig data transfer from you know AZ1 to AZ2. It, your costs are going to go up. Your performance is going to go down. You're going to be unhappy. Instead, you know, if you need higher availability, we would recommend a multi-cluster approach where you've got one running an AZ1, you've got a separate one running an AZ2, and you know, if one goes down, you know, you're uh, uh, you can just have LSF running uh, jobs against the the uh, smaller cluster that's still up. Don't do it with one big cluster spread across multiple AZs. Mighty bad approach. Uh, learn from some of the folks that have uh, tried this already, um, and, and we can certainly help you with that. Um, let me know if there are questions. But here's where Soka fits in. Um, uh, Soka is a great, you know, reference architecture and you know initial implementation. There's a lot of intellectual property that uh, Amazon and other folks have created and made available to you. You know, uh, you guys could download it directly yourself uh, and start using it, spin it up. But if you were to do that, yeah, you'd discover, hey, wait, you know, this is interesting. This has a lot of components, but it doesn't quite meet my needs. You might conclude then that, hey, the, the cloud isn't really ready for me to run my workloads there. Uh, for instance, if you uh, look over the right hand side, you know, uh, Amazon Elastic File System and, and Amazon S3 are highlighted. There's the storage options. FSX for Lustre is there, but it's uh, faded out because it's currently intended in the production release of Soka only to be there for scratch space. Well, you're going to need more performance than EFS can offer. So you're going to need something like FSX or NetApp CVO. And we've already done the work to integrate those as, you know, uh, first party solutions of, you know, they are going to work there for your, you know, persistent storage, not just for scratch space. Uh, if you look at uh, uh, user access, for instance, uh, uh, there's no you know built-in single sign-on. Well, we've already done some work to get that going. Uh, when it comes to uh, scheduling, uh, the one that's built in is PBS Pro. You may be going, but we want LSF. Well, we've already done some work to get that going. So it's a great framework, and we've co-developed. Um, uh, Amazon had done lots of work on the side that they have not uh, gotten permission to make publicly available. They've shared that with us. We've added to that and created a solution that's, you know, legitimately ready to run some of your production workloads. Um, it, it's not what you're going to see, you know, if you just go uh, look at uh, what's publicly available on your own. Uh, there's a, a, actually a lot more already available, already developed that we can help you guys consume on fairly short order. So if you're interested, please talk to us. <laughs> Let us help you get a head start. Uh, last thing I want to mention, th this is something that we highlighted quite a lot at our uh, Cloud Summit recently. We've got um, our CMLA, which stands for Cloud Migration Lifecycle Assurance. We have a very structured approach that we take to migrating workloads to the cloud. It's not just, hey, lift and shift, or hey, you know, uh, we've cobbled together some scripts. We can figure out how to spin up an, a, a set of infrastructure, and we hope it works for you. Um, discovery analysis, we, we spend a lot of time working on the business case of, you know, what are you going to need? What is it going to cost and how is that going to compare? And with things like the cloud adoption workshops, we can do a lot to train your team on here's what to expect from cloud. Here's how to think about cloud. Here's how you should plan on consuming it. Uh, when it comes to foundational planning and foundational build, we've already got a, a, a lot of uh, uh, intellectual property of our own that can help you guys uh, deploy a well-governed uh, environment much more quickly than if you were building something from scratch. Uh, and then, you know, one thing that I, I would highlight is when it comes to us talking about, here's how we would do uh, validation workloads in the cloud, or here's how we would do uh, full chip design workloads in the cloud, uh, bottom middle migration experience, uh, you could think of that as a, a pilot deployment or a proof of concept. That's where we get your application actually running uh, in the cloud so that you can see it, so that you can bang on it, so that you can figure out if there's something that needs to be adjusted before uh, we finish that you know, initial planning, initial building phase, and move into migration, uh, which is more of a migration factory of let's move workload after workload after workload. 
you know, that migration experience is where we make sure that we've done it right. You're going to get the performance you're looking for. You're going to get the, you know, uh, uh, TCO benefits that you're looking for before we jump in full tilt. Uh, let's hurry up and move everything else. So we bring a ton of expertise to, you know, everything, you know, uh, we've been, you know, designing, selling and deploying high performance computing uh, uh, clusters on premise for years. We know how to spin them up in the cloud and we know how to do the entire process of analyzing your applications and getting them migrated over to. Hope that makes sense. Um, that's the uh, prepared content, Tom. Uh, happy to open it up for uh, yeah. Questions. I'm going to add. I'm going to layer on to Dave the um, the collaboration hub. So one of the things we're doing is um, building out an onboarding service um, as well as an ongoing managed service. So. If you're looking at that kind of third party collaboration that you've got to do, so we've got the security built in such that it's really just one way access and, you know, they can't basically download anything to, you know, their laptop or their computer and then be able to take source code away. Uh, we've built that that this with um, uh, one of the major um, fabs, um, fabulous semiconductor manufacturers. <laughs> in the world um, uh, to really basically uh, secure the PDKs. So there would be no way for an end customer to um, take a PDK. Um, so to enable to get your end customer onboarded, uh, that's where we have sort of a, a managed service. And then for the ongoing support, you know, kind of a help desk um, as well as then just anything that could go wrong within, you know, let's say doing the uh, the chip collaboration. So just just so you're not managing this, um, you know, kind of extra infrastructure that isn't part of the core team infrastructure. All right, any, any questions with regard to Soka, um, any, well, yeah, go uh, ahead. I, I want to chime in on the question that came in in chat regarding building chambers in the cloud and, and trying to do the licensing servers. Uh, Richard replied with, uh, you know, we'd have to provide VPN access uh, for the existing license server. Uh, we can do that with very high security because it's not just, hey, we're going to build uh, tunnels uh, within that uh, cloud chamber. We would be creating an endpoint uh, going from that cloud uh, chamber to the shared services, and only that license uh, information uh, is allowed to go through there. And then we have the security for uh, the VPN from the uh, shared services account uh, uh, to the on-premise environment. So it, it's actually at least a, a double or triple layer of security that we would have there. Sorry, that was just me nerding out a little bit. No, no, that's 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 good. That's uh, that's perfect. Uh, any other questions out there? Uh, questions have kind of slowed in chat. This is Jimmy from Mythic at uh, So my question centers kind of around uh, what scale. Hey, Jimmy, and Jimmy, sorry, I'm going to cut you off. In mine, it sounds like you're in witness protection. So, okay. I don't like maybe the headphone. Uh, sorry. But I still want to hear your question. I didn't mean to cut you off, but. That's all right. It's my horrible Bluetooth. So, headset. Right. Okay. Uh, so, I guess my question is we're a startup and, you know, our whole high performance compute cluster on on prem here is like six servers. So at what scale do you start seeing advantages of moving to cloud um, as, as somebody's growing up? Immediate, because you still have all of the requirements, right? License server, you know, you've got obviously the compute you need, you need the file-based storage. Um, I know for your instance, you're doing kind of AIML collaboration with clients around, I think it's an ASIC. 
Um, you would need that kind of collaboration hub deployment. We're working with another client in your space um, with the same kind of problem set, but yeah, immediately. And in fact, the universities that we're working with through a client called Muse, um, they've kind of separated. They got about 100 universities that do semiconductor design as a, uh, let's say, as a, as a um, uh, college within the their science college, right? So they're separating them out. Like top 10% really function more like a like a bona fide semiconductor design shop basically doing, you know, seven nanometer, five nanometer designs. So that's going to be a pretty significant um, infrastructure build. But the rest of the 90% are kind of similar, right? It, it's it's a server with a five-year depreciation with direct attached storage. Um, but even that, that that's, a, that's a use case for cloud, right? Why would you want to own that hardware when it's probably running at sub 40% utilization and you don't want to be in necessarily in the data center business. You're in the, you're in the AI ML, um, you know, putting it on an ASIC business. So, you know, that, that's really where, so, so no workload is too small um, just because the utilization numbers, you know, kind of bear the, uh, the ROI out. Well, I, I will say, Tom, that there is a, a little bit that goes into creating the shared services, and there is a small ongoing cost just from having the plumbing to be able to run workloads securely and well-governed in the cloud. So, you know, I, I think it's possible for a workload to be too small to run in the cloud, but, you know, it, it really is on the order of as soon as you have um, employees that are spending time sitting idle, waiting for something because they don't have the compute resources, then uh, you've already, ex you know, uh, tripped over the threshold where you should be um, spinning up things in the cloud to get them done faster. Gotcha. We're not quite there yet, but I can see it happening. Yeah, we can we can meet with you offline, Jimmy, and go through. You know, even the the small startup we're talking about, I think, has a a lot of similarities to your business, and we can go through the architecture we built with them. It's not full soak. Uh, it's uh, it's like a more of a um, app stream kind of like a lighter version of the SOCA architecture. So happy to kind of walk you through what our uh, thinking is there. Sounds good. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Okay, 